and I'm super excited to welcome um, Alex Elkins to end the day for us. Alex has a long career in the entrepreneurship space. Um, sorry, I always hate it when people describe my career as a long career as well. <laughs> I sort of ages you, nice. I didn't mean to do that. Um, but with 10 years at City, and he's currently moved into a new role at London South Bank University, where he is Director of Research, Enterprise and Innovation. Um, Alex always brings um, high energy to everything he does, which is exactly what we all need um, to, to end this day. Um, so welcome, Alex, and over to you. Hi, Emma. Thanks for the kind introduction there. I've got high energy to deliver now, though. That's that's OK. We'll, we'll, we'll try my best then. OK, I'm going to share my screen. Let's see how it all goes. So. Hopefully you can see those slides. Yes, that's great, Alex. Fantastic. OK, so welcome, everybody. And uh, thank you so much to Handshake and Greg and Salt for, for inviting me to give the, the final talk of the day. And, and this one is a bit of fun, but ho hopefully something that will help you in your day to day role. And, and the title was slightly provocative as well. Um, I can't draw. Let's talk about unleashing your creative superpower. So without any further delay, let's get on with it. <laughs> so as, as Emma's already mentioned, I've, I've had a career across a few institutions and more recently, London South Bank University, where I'm the Director of Research, Enterprise and Innovation. Uh, but previous to that, I was the head of entrepreneurship at City. And many years ago, I also worked in a lab um, and broke out of there into the world of employability and HE. I'm also the founder of a, a collective of uh, entrepreneurship enthusiasts called Startup Hire. So that's enough about me. And I've got a bit of a confession in that, although the, the title of the talk is around creativity, I'm no, by no means an expert in this field. Um, I'm not an academic that studies any type of creativity, but I have used it in all of my roles to try and liberate the best in people when we've, we've come to activities such as problem solving or ideation. One place I always like to start is just looking at the definition of creativity. So, so there are a few out there, obviously, and, and this is the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. And, and it's pretty good. I mean, it, it is the definition. So it's the use of skill and imagination to produce something new or to produce art. I like how they just chuck that on at the end there. And creativity is commonly associated with artistic practices. Another definition that I really like, though, is from Sir Ken Robinson, who, who sadly passed away a number of years ago. Um, but his definition, I think, really sums it up quite nicely. It's the process of having original ideas that, that add or have value. And um, creativity isn't an instantaneous thing. So I, I think the process there is really justified. But it's around originality, novelty, uh, and having something new that delivers something of value. And um, so Ken Robinson is famous for his TED talk, Our, Our Schools Killing Creativity, which explores that um, further. And apologies for those of you who have seen this a few times before, but I use this to describe how we use our brains. And neuroscientists will say, well, come on, that, that is far from the truth, and it, and it is. But for, for simple folk like me, it really helps. So on the left side of our brain, we tend to use that for logic and, and, and facts. But on the right side, that's where we use our creative superpower to generate new ideas, new content, new thoughts and things like that. So, so this is how our brain tends to operate. And that's where you hear people say things like um, it's better to use the right side of the brain for this activity or I'm more left brain uh, orientated. And creativity takes many forms. Uh, there are many personalities, uh, some of which are here, that utilise their creativity uh, to do the things that they do. And it's commonly associated with things like entrepreneurship, where people are creating new things or innovating, 
or disrupting an industry with their new products and services. But you'll find it very commonly in music, uh, acting, technology as well. There's a, there's a good argument for innovation and creativity in technology and also academia. And it's really about those, those skills and those qualities around curiosity and imagination and bringing those together to be even more creative. And creativity is really important as a skill set because it really, really does help with things like problem solving. And, and in my role now at London South Bank, innovation is a core part and creativity goes hand in hand with that. So how can I help my, my academic community liberate their research and applying that to the real world? Uh, that's a process of innovation. You, you're probably aware and, and hearing some of the talks already today um, that we we talked about some of the developments in terms of technology and what's coming down the line. And you may may not be aware that we're in the fourth industrial revolution where we've got technology connecting with things um, and we've got advancements in robots as well in the physical world. Uh, and it's about the skills and, and the qualities that we need to be able to adapt to that environment which is changing around us. And it's no more important for us than it is for those younger generations who will be entering that world of work with all of those changes already applied. So us as professionals and those who work with younger people or are helping uh, establish connections with that new job market need to be aware of those and, and be able to support students and, and younger people who are thinking about careers in the next 5, 10, 15 years, because the world will be quite a different place. So much so that robotics have advanced to the point where they can combine with AI and machine learning to even cook your food. Not that I need any more um, on a strict diet at the moment. Anyway, there, there are these types of advances that will be in, in people's homes in the next 10 to 15 years. And we've seen a number of videos as well already. <clears throat> which document some of the, the quite scary advances in, in how, how well robots can mimic animals and people and, and do tasks as, as we once did. So it's, it's really interesting to see this development, and this has come through a creative process in itself, um, but it's being aware of these challenges that are coming down the line. Sorry, I stopped him dancing there, but... Uh, and, and, and I didn't think that any session today would not mention this, uh, but the, the rise in, in open access to platforms such as ChatGPT, and there are many others as well, where you can create images from just suggesting um, a few ideas, are really important in how, how it, how it complements our creativity and how we can use these. Uh, in day-to-day -day, uh, working life or maybe in the home too. And I've used this on a number of occasions, uh, which I'll come on to later. And, and there are do-mongers. I mean, there were some, some excellent films in the 80s and early 90s that, that predicted the rise of the robots. Um, but I'm positive <laughs> that we won't end up in this situation. Can't guarantee it. So thinking about the skills and, and the types of work uh, in the future, we, we've heard a lot already about uh, new types of role and, and how we need to prepare people for them and, and also the world around us. Uh, this is the robot curve, and I normally present this when we're talking about um, creativity because it's a skill set. And Marty Neumeyer was, a, was an expert in, in marketing and he wrote a book called Metaskills, Five Talents for the Robotic Age. Uh, and it's, it's a known fact that many jobs um, or types of work are being automated. And the further up this curve you go are the, are the skills that won't be as easy to automate or, or we won't try to automate them as much. And, and you'll see at the very top of the curve there, that we've got creative work um, and, and that is very hard to replicate. Whereas some of the other roles which we've already seen being automated, especially across practices like the, um, the legal practice where we have contracts and, and um, terms and conditions and things like that 
purely being automated. We're even seeing some of those highly skilled professions have elements of, of their day to day automated. So it's really important that we keep um, creative um, skill sets and problem solving at the top of that in terms of what we want to develop for us and, and for those that we're working with. So it really is a creative superpower. And it's about how do we harness that and use it best? Uh, and you'll probably recognize this scene um, from Stranger Things. So I've got a, a small challenge for everybody. Um, this, as you can see, is a desk, quite a minimalist desk at that. There isn't much going on there. Have a, have a look at the, the blank wall or maybe the potted plant on the side. Um, but what I'd like you to do now, and I'm going to give you two minutes, actually, not just one, because that's a little bit unfair of me, is I want you to design the desk of the future. And please just grab a notepad or just do it in your head um, or whatever you have access to right now. Think about new concepts for a desk of the future. And I'm going to give you two minutes to do that now. I haven't got any music. Mike Gray said he might sing for me, um, but I doubt that's going to happen. So we'll just have a, a slightly awkward two minutes in silence, and I'll try to keep quiet while you do that. Then afterwards, I'd like to hear a bit about what you came up with. So I'm going to time you. Let's start that now. One more minute to go. You've got 10 seconds left. Three, two, one, stop. OK, it was a slightly awkward two minutes in silence for me, but hopefully you managed to get on with the task. So let's I'm going to be keeping my eye on the um, chat. So. In those ideas that you had, <clears throat> if you um, wouldn't mind sharing in a second, within your ideas that you created, did you still have a desk? Did you still have a chair? Did you still have something to sit on, to place something on? Or did you go to more of an option two where you considered maybe the desk is merely a concept? Maybe we can wear a desk. Maybe we can... Um, Travel in time. Maybe there are no boundaries or constraints here. I didn't. I didn't put any boundaries or constraints other than just design a desk. So, who would like to? Um, so, in the chat, if you can just say, if you were more option one or option two. There's some fun things coming in here. Just swipe control. That's a bit like Minority Report. Oh, we've got a real mix actually. This is quite interesting. A bit of both, so somewhere in between. 
Oh, this is great that you've considered option two more. And then gradually, I suppose, we'll move on to the next slide in a minute. I like this too. We've got Amy Longston here. She's put option one, but my desk moves itself around and has a very advanced massage chair. But well, yeah, sold. Um, if you can design that and start selling that for, a, for an affordable price, that would be wonderful. Um, so the, the purpose of that exercise was one, to engage you, uh, but also there's a bit of theory behind this in terms of ideation. Yeah, keep sharing your ideas. Dog entertainment. If you can get a toddler entertainment module as well in there, that would be great. Um, so here we go. When we think about coming up with new ideas for the first time, <clears throat> when we're faced with that, that initial challenge, because we are adults mostly, um, we like to solve the problem in front of us. So when thinking about that desk, you probably couldn't escape the image of a desk in your mind. You're sat at one probably, or a kitchen workshop or, or wherever you find space to do work. And so a lot of our ideas in terms of the quantity will link very closely to what that problem is. And then that will start to plateau and run out because there's only so many ways that you can think of having a desk and a chair and a workstation. But then there might have been this moment of madness where we've just got swipe screens, maybe it's just a pair of glasses, um, maybe it isn't even a desk whatsoever. Maybe you focused on something, like I said earlier, around time travel. Don't be bound by timelines and things like that and really went out there. And then that would have sparked a new set of ideas which have triggered you into this, this novel and new space where, where really that's where the magic happens. And that's what I try and do with people that I work with is remove them from that, that space of, of iterations on the current problem or the current idea and push them into that other side. And that's very much what creative agencies try and do as well. Um, and at the forefront of technology and, and all of those other practices is being different to what's currently there. And you may have seen this before as well, but that activity is about divergent thinking and giving you freedom to just generate generate lots of ideas that are free flowing. There's no judgment on them, no constraints. It's just looking at uh, being free with those choices that you're making. And then it's that the later phase when you might have to put it into the real world and you apply the, the laws and things like that that you need to do. And there are three measures. They're quite rough measures. I mean, that exercise is quite rough and ready anyway. Um, but measures of creativity. One is how many things can you generate? So quantity is a really good measure. The other one is complexity. So how complex is your idea? How many components did it have? What, what type of narrative did it have around it? Uh, and, and the other one is, is, is the novelty. How, how new is it and how different is it to everything else? And that's what we try and use, especially in sessions which I've run with students when we're trying to um, solve problems together or in hackathons where we've got a grand challenge, um, we do divergent thinking first because I don't want people trying to strap laws and, and, and boundaries on things when they're going through that creative phase. It's very important not to do that. And this quote, uh, it's got many iterations, this quote as well. Seth Godin was um, famous for advertising and he's got a number of books out there, but uh, he puts it quite rightly that we were all born creative. And you'll see that if you've got kids or you or you um, work with uh, younger children, uh, that they don't have these boundaries that some of us do have. It takes a little while for that to kick in and us to become afraid or less free with some of our thought. And um, uh, it's it's something that we need to change particularly for graduates as well, because I think the education system in many ways, and going back to Sir Ken's talk, um, has applied you know, a framework, which is hard to escape. Who's heard this in their workplace recently, or, or maybe they've been to a shop and tried to return something or engage, and, and the policy says no, or the computer says no. It's, it's a phrase which is so common, um, and it doesn't, 
it doesn't get challenged enough. And particularly for those of us who are creative or, or trying to, to move things forward, it should be, at first, it's probably a bit like this. Oh, not that again. Oh, come on. But then it should spark or trigger um, us to think about how can we solve that and how can we get something better uh, than we currently have. And this is what entrepreneurs do all the time. And there are many, many brilliant companies that do this and there are brilliant founders behind all of these companies uh, so a, a slight whirlwind tour of this uh, Patagonia as many of you will have heard of recently is a clothing brand for those of you that don't know but they their primary mission is that they are planet first so everything they do has to contribute to making the world a better place and that's in their mission statement and it's in the way that they work and they started out in the 70s and the founder um uh Eve, Eve, Eve Schwenard, um recently donated three billion dollars worth of his shares to a trust which is supporting um global climate change and, and preventing that so they're they're challenge was well why do we have to make clothes in the, in the same way that everybody else does why can't we use recycled products why can't we look at the circular economy and utilize that a lot better similarly with some of these other logos that you see here so olio their challenge was well why is there so much food being wasted people are hungry in the world and food waste contributes to to massive problems globally so they've designed an app where people can share food with those who want it and want to, to eat it. Uh, and they also donate heavily to food banks and things like that too. And we've got other disruptors who have also challenged homelessness. So Beam uh, is a crowdfunding platform, but you crowdfund somebody's qualifications, a homeless person's qualifications, so that they can get back into work. And, and evidence suggests that work and a roof over someone's head is the best way to prevent homelessness. And there are many other brilliant companies out there, but I thought I'd highlight those. I suspect everybody in the room will be familiar with these because most university strategies and indeed any corporate strategy will have probably utilised these in that development, which is a really positive thing. I don't mean to sound cynical there. Um, all of these um, sustainability or sus sustainability goals um, are brilliant because they're purpose-led, they have core problems in the world, and these are now being introduced uh, to make companies operate better, um, people who are in charge of lots of people, for example, so it might be large corporations who, who run lots of programmes, are embedding these into the way that they work, and that's really positive, being purpose-driven. I think there's another interesting point around this so I've, I've worked with lots of social enterprises and, and helped a number of, of companies become more ethical and you'll see things like b corps or having the social enterprise mark uh, is that i've seen a trend sorry sorry this is a it's not based on any research it's based on my own experience in that graduates are are, are actively seeking companies that have a clear mission statement um, that is bringing positivity into the world or contributing to something to make it better. Uh, and so th that's something that, that we, can, we can really support in our roles. And on the flip side of that, <clears throat> where, where I've just told you to go no constraints and, and be really free with your thinking, there's also the reverse. When we see constraints applied in, in a quite intense environment we've seen brilliant innovation in that space too if you think about vaccine development and production that was rapidly accelerated um, through through many means so we saw advances in science in this time but we also saw the way that we work change almost overnight and now i would i would argue that the practices that we have coming out of that in terms of the workplace are much healthier for productivity and creativity. Um, and I've seen brilliant changes in my team just in allowing more flexibility between hybrid working and things like that. So let's get to the core of it then. Um, I've got 
10 minutes left, I think. Let's talk about some of the ways to liberate your creativity, or it might be people that you're working with. And these are some of the techniques that I've used. <clears throat> Again, I just want to emphasize, and this quote does that to some degree, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. Um, and it's important to make sure uh, that when we are trying to liberate our creativity, that you dedicate time and a space to do that. Don't try and combine it with other activities. Um, although you'll you'll see in the next set of slides that there are activities that we do already where creativity does pop into our um, consciousness. So failure, it is branded with a very negative connotation. In the startup world, it's celebrated avidly. And there are events that you can attend up and down the country. It's, a, it's an official thing called F Up Nights. I won't say the full words. Um, and this is where entrepreneurs will come along, or anybody actually, to, to celebrate some of the biggest F Ups they've had in their career. And, and that's championed because failure is a learning process. And without failure, you won't learn or improve. Uh, and for us to be able to celebrate failure, I think it's really important, particularly uh, in being open and creative in that practice. So making sure that you can do that, whether it's through events or, or appraisals or whatever it might be, taking risks and, and celebrating failure. There's a lot of noise, um, particularly when you open your laptop or log on. And that really dampens creativity because it's full of distractions and it's full of things that are mundane and it's full of things that aren't particularly helpful when you're trying to be creative. So it's a nice idea sometimes to switch to be analog. So a pen and paper doodling, you'll find that um, you get a, a lot better clarity and also free flow flowing thought. Uh, so try that as much as you can. And you might do this as a hobby as well, which is even better. Um, but try and remove yourself should you need to solve a grand challenge of your own, um, or if you've got a particularly tricky problem, go analog. And um, if any of you work in the field of UX design or, or, or anything in terms of design, product design, sketchbooks, post-its, that's the way that it operates first. It's analog first almost. I share this one quite a lot, so apologies if you've heard this before, and I'm not actively encouraging you to go back to your, your, your companies and your institutions and say, well, I just heard that um, I should be sleeping more on the job. But there is really good evidence to suggest that after 20 minutes of uh, having a good 20 minute nap, you are intensely more productive. And so getting the right amount of sleep throughout the day will really help. And productivity goes in hand in hand with trying to be creative too. So um, there's a little tip for you. Hopefully none of you have nodded off just yet. Having a healthy relationship with caffeine, I think is the best way to put this. So there are certain food and drink substances that you might use on a day-to-day -day basis, and some will really help you and some will, will maybe hinder you. Um, but it's understanding what works well for you. And I've just told you that you should go and have a nap. Um, and I'm also now telling you to have a coffee. Now, there is a nice way of combining these two activities. If you, um, if you know that you need a 20-minute nap, you should also know that caffeine kicks in after around 20 minutes. So if you have your coffee, have a nap, just do your 20 minutes. When you wake up, you will be supercharged for productivity. Um, it's what I affectionately like to call the nappuccino. Th there's a lot of work that's um, suggested that any time away from your desk, and you may have heard of things like the Pomodoro technique and um, the 2020 rule, removing yourself away from your day-to-day -day work or the tasks that you're working on at that time is a really good idea to help you spark some extra surge of creativity within that task. And the best place to do it is actually to get outside uh, and be at one with nature. So I think there's a big argument there for, for fresh oxygen um, rather than air conditioning systems and things like that. But it's also good to connect with your surroundings and being in a green space. So you will see um, lots of people now doing walk and talk meetings 
Um, so getting the blood flowing and, and, and breathing in fresh air really helps with productivity and creativity. Many of you, I am sure, play an instrument. Um, and, and that's really good because lots of evidence suggests that doing this type of activity as a hobby um, really enhances your creativity uh, within, within whatever work that you do. And there was a, a brief study on Nobel uh, Prize winners around what extracurricular activities did they do? And the most common thing that they picked up amongst those winners was that most of them played an instrument of some sort. So bear that in mind. There's, as I mentioned earlier, there's lots of mundane activities that we do day to day. Uh, brushing teeth, hoovering, folding clothes, that type of thing. Um, and in that time, your mind isn't, um, isn't dead. There's a subconscious in there. And it's often at those times that you get that eureka moment. Uh, and that sparks a gem. So, uh, OK, I'm telling you to drink more coffee, sleep more uh, and do more boring things. So there's a bit of a contradiction there, but may maybe this will help in some way. Uh, but it's important that when you're in the shower for, for whatever reason is to really switch off um, and brushing your teeth and hoovering because these moments will hit you and then that will trigger a whole set of other thoughts of creativity i really think there's a market for a notebook in the shower or in the bathroom um a waterproof one i suppose is all it takes but but there we go you may have done this with your students or or in your workplaces when um doing an ideation session or a strategy building session or something like that it's often best not to do it in the traditional way with a flip chart or a presentation or something like that Try and get people to orientate around physical objects and Lego series play is a, is a really big deal these days because it gets you thinking differently and, and, and also challenges you to convey things in a different way. So trying to describe how your model is, is the answer to how you're going to embed AI in your exam process. Um, this will help you describe it in many different ways and consider other stuff too. So serious play is um, a good way of doing that. A very old technique, uh, Edward de Bono's Six Thinking Hats. What this does is if, if, and we use this a lot in research sand pits to bring ideas together around a certain proposal or a challenge uh, that one of the research councils have put out, for example, is get academics in a room and get people to wear these hats and it gets them to challenge it from a different perspective, especially if it's a different perspective to the way that you normally think. So the black hat has the one with the potential problems and why something might not work so it's quite a negative hat the yellow one's focusing on the values and the benefits so so that you normally get those two arguing which is quite fun actually but this one i haven't used um, a lot myself but this is the lotus technique where you put your your problem or your challenge in the middle and then iterate on that with as many points of iteration as you possibly can building the idea outwards um, it's a, it looks like a cool technique and I, I will be trying it soon and then of course mind mapping mind mapping is something that's quite well known and well used and it really does help people who are comfortable with um, drawing and also annotating but it's also that chain and the connection of things uh, that really helps with spawning new thoughts and, and creative processes uh, and that, that's the real aim of this type of exercise and of course if you get stuck just ask chat gpt there's no harm in doing that there are lots of tools out there um, and sorry, I was being a little bit facetious there. Um, these tools are very useful in many respects, and I've used them um, recently, in fact. I think Mike mentioned earlier that um, people are writing strategies and, and ChatGPT has been supporting that. I'd already, already written a strategy, which I thought was quite dynamic and creative. I asked ChatGPT with my um, what I needed to include in it. And it came out with something very, very close. Um, so I should have started with ChatGPT Chat and then 
branched off on that and really been more novel. Um, so yeah, I feel slightly like the robots are out doing me there, but there we go. And you would have seen this before. A lot of us are very comfortable doing what we know and, and what we're good at. But often what you need to do is work with people who have different ways of thinking from different places, different walks of life, um, and put yourself in a more uncomfortable position so that you can get to where the magic happens. Uh, and that's the process of learning, um, developing your neurons to help you with that creative practice and developing it even further. There are many books out there. These are just some uh, that I think are relatively good and they're all popular science books. So they're not too tricky to read. They are based on research as well though. So they're founded in facts, um, but there's lots there that are um, interesting and you'll find there's lots of lists of top 100 creative books and things like that. So a few more things just to help you if you have to present or facilitate a session. There's a few activities, a bit like the one on the, um, the desk. Um, and these, these are some that are really quick, good icebreakers, but might prompt even more creativity when you're doing it. So 30 circles. So give people 30 identical circles and tell people to make them all different. So this is just sketching on them, drawing on them, putting other things in the room that you might have, like sticky eyes or something like that, uh, and just decorating them all completely differently. Um, that's a really fun activity. Dictionary storytelling, open the dictionary randomly, point at the word and make a story between the word above it and the word below. That's a really good activity just to get people talking and, and, and expressing themselves. Bad ideas, get the room, give them a challenge and tell them to come up with the worst ideas they can think imaginable uh, instead of any good ideas. It flips the thinking, gets people using a different part, part of their brain uh, and get some really good discussions going. Get out of the building, that one we've already uh, walked through. <laughs> uh, the paperclip test, that's very famous. Alternative uses for a paperclip in one minute. Do that. Um, I, I move away from the paperclip these days and, and use a jam jar, but you can use any mundane object that you want. And new out of two, another really good um, it's combinational creativity. We have two different objects. One might be very different to the other. How can you make something brilliant out of those two objects? So that brings me to the end of my talk. So obviously a mic drop there. Thank you very much for your time. I hope that's helped in some way. Um, I'm sorry it didn't help you draw any better, probably, but hopefully it sparked a few new ideas for you to go back to your workplaces and, and embrace creativity. So there we are. My name, if you missed it at the beginning, is Alex Elkins. You can connect with me on LinkedIn, or that's my email address there too. And that's a, that's a rather happy sloth. So I'll stop presenting there. Thanks, Alex. That was um, a brilliant way for us to end the day. Loads and loads of really useful tips in there. We do have some questions um, in the chat. If you've got a few minutes, just to just to stick around and answer them. So, um, first question from um, Helen Varley. Um, Helen's intrigued by Lego Serious Play. She'd like to hear any advice for setting up or facilitating these or other activities, i.e. can you talk a bit about the balance of structure and freedom? Oh, yeah, that's really good. So the, the Lego Serious Play, the, there is an official, you can do a training programme on that. And there are many people who are, are officially qualified as serious players. Um, I'm not one of those, but I know quite a few of them who are. Um, and I think it's it's quite clear on the website. There might even be some in the room, actually. I think there was a mention there about VJ, perhaps. Um, the structure and freedom, I've gone, um, so particularly when we run hackathons um, and activities like that, design jams, uh, which is, is more about an idea rather than anyone having to develop anything. I think when you're working with large numbers of students, a bit of structure does actually go a long way. You can you can give spaces within the program to be as free and as open as possible. Um, but if you've got an output or an outcome that you're trying to get to, particularly within an assessment or something like that, 
uh, then it does help to have a bit of structure. So it is a balance. Sorry, I'm sitting on the fence here, but we've done it both ways. Once I went too free and open and we got no outputs and everyone was a bit like, what was that for? And then on the other side, we added too much structure and it, it was a bit too constrained. So we got a good balance. And, and I mean, you can do it over a day. I've done one in an hour. I've done one um, in, in three days over a weekend. In fact, with students camping, uh, that was a bit of a nightmare. But I hope that helps. Happy to share sort of um, structures that worked or have worked for me. Super intrigued by the camping now, but I won't go down that route <laughs> and explore, explore that anymore. Um, you talked about creating a safe space um, for innovation to happen and, and for thinking to happen. Have you got any tips on doing this with teams in HE? Yeah, it, it's um, so I've done this both with my own team. So that's, that's about 50 people uh, and also with groups of students as well cohorts you know quite large and and then also a one-to-one -one basis and I think as long as you're open at the start of any activity uh, or in the culture so some of you might have a mission statement or you might have uh, a code of practice and, and one of the things that we have we, we obviously have our institutional uh, values but within my team there are a set of cultural behaviors that we decided were important. You'll see these with a number of companies as well. And um, freedom to fail was one of them. Uh, and because we just want people to experiment and, and, and take a few risks, as long as they're not hugely expensive. I mean, that you've got to have a limit somewhere. Uh, but we've seen brilliant innovations come from that. And it's companies like Google, for example, where Gmail was part of that, that cultural practice of freedom to fail, where people were just trying things that I think they were given something like 25% of their time to do that. Uh, so that's what I do. I, I try and work with your teams to, to put in that code of practice between you or a manifesto, you know, manifesto for us uh, with some of those those agreements around your culture and how you want to do it with students it's about opening sessions with that so everybody understands it within that room uh, and and they take to it really well actually that's that's not so much of a problem it's more 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 issues I've had is when it's uh, within HE with my own staff uh, and, and trying to encourage that as a practice because we've been working in HE for so long you know and policies and procurement regs and things like that are hard to get around sometimes I think it's that and I think we, we, we do have a lot of but we've always done it like that and it's worked and we haven't got time to change it and I think we, we need to really make make that time in that space and um, final question Alex um, now you've moved into a role with a wider brief how can employability professionals better engage with the wider ecosystems of research great question and this is something I suppose I'm fortunate in that I've worked in employability and uh, entrepreneurship, the student, student side of that mostly. And, and now I've got a team which is trying to help academics deliver research. And I'm, I'm very well, I'm, I suppose I'm fortunate as well that I'm very well connected with the people who lead those streams of work. So I've got um, the PVC for Education at London South Bank is very interested in student knowledge exchange, especially entrepreneurship and education, uh, enterprise education. But one of the themes that I've I've recommended is that it's research informed teaching, and I, that always I think scares people somewhat because you think that research is very bulky and very complex. But actually, what's happening in research is at the leading edge of everything that we're doing. Generally speaking, you know, it's research is producing new findings. And if you can incorporate that into your everyday employability uh, or, or the general content of any program, then you're helping those students get access to knowledge that not even people like us have because it hasn't been public, you know, it hasn't been published popularly by news, news sites and things like that. So it's a real privilege, I think, to have research informed teaching going on. Um, and that that should overlap in terms of the skills that we develop for employability. It's a real it's a real benefit to have that on your CV as well if you've engaged in a, a part of research in any way. I think that's that's super interesting. I think one of the key themes that's emerged from lots of our talks today has been that connecting to other things that are going on in the institution and, and collaborating. 
So, so that's great, a great point to end on. Thanks so much, Alex.